Rubens was great because he was never merely tasteful. Everything he did, he did by extremes, painting sex and violence more sensually than any previous Northern European painter, using brighter colours, starker contrasts of light and shade, even turning up the volume of painting, so it's as if you can hear the screams of his victims and the sighs of his lovers. But how do you do justice to such a towering figure in a single exhibition? That's the challenge the National Gallery has taken on, and they've decided to focus exclusively on his beginnings. In effect, they've staked everything on the premise that you can only get to grips with genius if you understand where it came from. Antwerp today has the fourth largest port in the world, and the city's wealth always was built on trade and exchange. And you could say that the city's most famous son, Peter Paul Rubens, was himself a master of the import-export business. At the start of his career, Rubens, like many another Antwerp entrepreneur, travelled to Italy. He spent eight years there, learning and taking stock. He looked at the very latest in modern art, Caravaggio in particular, as well as Titian and Michelangelo. He absorbed their innovations and brewed up many of his own. And when he came back, he burst on his native city like a shooting star. It was with this great picture that Rubens, aged just 33, announced his arrival as a painter obviously destined for great things. It instantly eclipsed the work of every other artist in Antwerp and placed Rubens and Rubens alone absolutely centre stage. And what a fantastically theatrical piece of painting it is. The subject is the raising of Christ's body on the cross, a moment of sheer physical drama. You've got this diagonal, thrusting diagonal that brings the body of Christ up into the centre of the picture. It's as if everything revolves around that. And you can feel the weight of his body. You can feel it in the efforts of these huge muscled executioners as they pull the cross into place. The sheer struggle of trying to crucify a man is something that Rubens brilliantly expresses. It draws you, the viewer, towards it too, so that you feel drawn in and forced to question what your response would have been to his crucifixion had you been there at this freeze-framed moment. I think we shouldn't underestimate the impact of its sheer scale. It's an enormous picture, 21 feet across, 15 feet high. Almost nothing like it had been seen in Northern Europe before. So much energy, so much life, so much colour, so much muscular force. Everything that would make Rubens Rubens is contained in this fantastic picture. But that's just the problem for the National Gallery, because it's far too large to travel to London. So how, in its absence, are they going to convey the essence of Rubens? One resource they can call on is a mass of extraordinary drawings, which vividly convey his tactile embrace of the human body, the way he looks at it more like a sculptor than a painter, as something you can touch as well as just see. Also on show will be some of his most brilliant easel paintings, like Samson and Delilah, the dark tale of a man undone by his own lust, which points to the other side of Rubens' genius, his profound, uneasy humanity. Rubens' family had very close links with this, the festive and civic centre of Antwerp, a site associated with the memory of a great trauma, because in 1576, the year before Rubens was born, the Spanish invaded the city and they burnt the town hall to the ground. And I think that sense of civilization as something essentially fragile, perpetually under threat from the spectre of violence and war, always remain very much at the centre of Rubens' art. The keystone of the National Gallery's show, I'm sure, will be the massacre of the innocents, the very darkest of his early works. It really is a masterpiece, and it's about the brutality of war. It's about a subject that affects us all, even today. Rubens' subject is one of the nastiest stories in the Bible, that moment when Herod has ordered all his soldiers to kill every firstborn child to stop any one of them becoming a messiah. But I think what Rubens has actually painted is the horrible implacability of the act of genocide. He's trapped the women and their children in this freeze by embedding them into a kind of human bas relief you can't you can't get out of it it's as if you've become part of a sculpture and he he 
enhances that sense of the inescapability of the predicament by having these two women flee with their babies towards the gate, trying to leave the city, but no, they're met by soldiers with spears. There really is no way out. But what's really disconcerting and, and troubling, but also very moving about the picture is the way in which Rubens seems to imply in this uneasy battle of the sexes that there's some rather unpleasant connection between the human urge to kill and the sex urge. It's a parody of an orgy. The figures could almost be embracing one another. These could be acts of sex gone horribly wrong. This soldier leans over the withered crone, his hand over her mouth as her breast falls out of her bodice and he makes ready to penetrate her with his sword. This beautifully coiffed Venetian aristocrat of a woman is scratching the face of the man who's trying at the same time to tug her baby away from her. What you get from it ultimately is Rubin's incredible appetite for life. Rubin's lived for a long time, long enough to become a prince of painters with a mass of orders from the crowned heads of Europe. Although the older he got, the more he had to rely on assistance. So you could say that it's only by looking at the beginning of his career that you get Rubens at his purest, unobscured by the side effects of fame. By the time of his death in 1640, Rubens had become a legend. He'd covered the churches and palaces of northern Europe with acre upon acre of paintings that would make his name live forever. But what I think is really important about the National Gallery's exhibition is that it simply reminds us that Rubens, like every great artist, was once a young man, full of passion, full of enthusiasm, full of immense creative originality. It reminds us that he was once, like us, a real life, flesh and blood human being. So for all the inevitable gaps and omissions, I'm optimistic that this will turn out to be one of the most memorable and moving shows of the year. Rubens, a master in the making, opens at the National Gallery in London on October the 26th and it runs until January the